Imagine we're working together. You have some functional Scala experience and have to start contributing to the Haskell code. This, other things I would share with you over some period of time. We'll cover the main differences, similarities, major gotchas, and most useful resources. Consider this a rough map. Just looking at this won't make you a professional Haskell developer, but it should certainly save you and the rest of the team plenty of time. I will say and use Haskell and GHC interchangeably, which is technically incorrect, but it's 2024, so who cares? You can and should pick up syntax by yourself. Yourself. But here is the thing that you should conquer first. You have to get used to reading chains of operations in the opposite direction. Take this Scala code. We have some function that takes an error, it extracts the error message out of the error, then wraps it in the left and lifts it into a pure F whatever. There are multiple ways to translate this into Haskell. The most straightforward way is to write a function foo that takes an error and then note that we also extract the error message out of the error, lift it into the left and pure, but notice the order of functions and the way we call those functions. There are no parentheses after extract error message. We have parentheses in other places, but for the associativity, not for function calls. And once again, first we extract, then we lift it in left, and then we lift it with pure. We can avoid even more parentheses by using function application operator. This dollar is just the same. In the simplest case, f dollar $x means call function f with x. And in the full case, it's extract error message, then left, and then pure. We can avoid the rest of the plumbing by using function composition. Instead of explicitly having an error and then passing it around, we skip it, we just say extract error message, lift and pure, that's it. In the wild, you'll see all of these styles as well as their mix. And did you notice that Haskell function had no type signatures? Haskell is pretty good at inferring types. We can omit type signature even in the top level definitions. We can, but it doesn't mean that we should. The type signature goes above the function definition. It might feel awkward to connect a name to a type, especially in the bigger cases. It could be hard to map user to user, password to password, token to token, but among other things, it allows you to focus on types and ignore the names. And the undefined value is like a type inference friendly cousin no triple question mark. It's pretty handy to make things compile. The last thing I want to cover before we move to more interesting things is about common function names and operators. For reasons, Haskell has a map function that only works on lists. If you're looking for functors map, you have to use a map. Also, there is no flat map, there is bind operator. And in general, Haskell code bases and developers are usually more operator tolerable. Some say they are too tolerable. In this example, we use an operator for bind and use an operator for map or <laughs> map. Good news, traverse is still traverse and everything else you can pick up as you go. Let's talk about basic concepts. As I mentioned in the first Haskell versus Scala video, in Haskell, function composition and currying are first-class citizens. Both are powerful enough to make the code tidier and elegant, as well as opposite. You certainly have to practice to get better at writing and reading both. If you find some code confusing, or yourself wrote some code that the compiler doesn't accept and you don't understand why, try rewriting it. Make it more verbose, introduce intermediate variables, and so on. It's okay, it's not a one-liner competition. For example, we can decompose the current one-liner into subscription function, user subscription function, and so on. Also, if it feels like number of arguments is getting out of control, you can just try introducing records. Instead of using user ID, subscription ID, whatever URLs, caches, and so on, we can group them as configs and group them as user IDs or whatever other input parameters. And then instead of having to deal with different parameters, we just extract stuff out of the record as needed. When writing Haskell, you cannot just use a quick variable or a temporary println. Depending on your experience and workflows, it can be or not be a big deal. You might need to get used to it. You can start by getting familiar with debug trace, which allows you to use function like trace show ID to trace some stuff. And not because of laziness, it might not be as trivial because a value might never be evaluated, so you're not gonna see a trace. See debugging without the real debugger reader for more information. Otherwise, I think you should not worry about laziness at the beginning of your journey. Trust the compiler. If you are too worried about performance and resources, you can keep an eye on the metrics and stuff. When needed, use the existing code as reference. For example, if you see exclamation points called bank patterns or a strict data extension where the data is defined, copy paste first and ask question later. In pull request reviews, for example. Here are two great series on laziness in Haskell, but you can find even more online if you want to. In Haskell, there are no classes and objects. You might quickly run into a problem with naming conflicts. For example, you can try to use a filter function and then the compiler is not going to know do you want to use a filter from data list or from the data text. You have to get into a habit of using qualified imports. Like in this example, we import qualified data text as text and use text as filter. And note that some people prefer to use even shorter names like L for list and T for text, just a stylistic choice. Some libraries suggest the users to qualify the imports. Some people prefer to qualify all the imports. But at the end of the day, once again, it's a personal or team choice. I'd say start using 
qualify imports for collections or containers and strings, texts and byte strings, and see how it goes. You should pay attention when using Haskell standard library, at least for two reasons. In case you didn't know, standard library or standard module is called Prelude. It's imported by default into all Haskell modules unless explicitly imported or disabled by the known implicit Prelude extension. So back to the reasons to be cautious. It provides things that you shouldn't use in production. For example, head that crashes a program on an empty list. It provides string type, which you should not use, C text or byte string, lazy AI operations, C streaming libraries instead, and so on. Also C overloaded string extension. The second reason, it does not provide things that you might expect or provides them in unexpected ways. For example, there is no distinct to ignore duplicate elements from a list, but there is nop, there is no contains, but there is lm, which is commonly written using infix form. And note that lm is not prefixed with list because it comes from foldable and stuff like that. Just be more open-minded and careful. And note that some companies use alternative preludes. It could be existing open source one or some custom preludes inside a company. Let's move on to types. There is no easy way to put this. Records in Haskell can be irritating. I mean, they are irritating. You'll find out really fast. It's annoying when you use records with the same field names. For example, if you have two subscription IDs, the compiler is going to tell you you have multiple declaration of subscription IDs. And it's annoying when you need to access or update nested records. I'm not even going to bother illustrating this. So what I would recommend. I would not recommend using vanilla records. You have to get familiar with a couple of extensions. You can start with overload record dot, which is available since GC920, and duplicate record fields. Additional you can look at no field selector, which is included in GC2021, and named field puns, which is also included, and maybe, maybe a record while cards. But you shouldn't expect a smooth write even with all those extensions. We cover GC2021 in the extension section. It's also common to use lenses via some optics library to deal with records, and there are quite a few options. Just pick your poison. You can use lens, optics, generic lens, lens simple, micro lens, profactor optics, pro lens, and others. And if you cannot afford GC920 or higher and cannot afford lenses, you can also check out GetField. It can be unexpected, but Haskell allows partial field accessor, even though it comes with a warning. I I'm mentioning this just in case. I've never cared or worried about this. Just use pattern matching like you would in Scala. What in the Java world is called generics, in the Haskell world is called parametric polymorphism. If you look at the type signature filter, we can see that it works for any A. It's polymorphic. A is a type parameter. I don't want to go into details here. You shouldn't see that that often, but eventually see explicit universal qualification and for all. Other than that, in general practice, it's not that different from Scala. So let's talk about ad hoc polymorphism. Unlike Scala, Haskell has a built-in type classes. There is guaranteed to be at most one instance of a type class per type. So good news, no need to worry about imports. There are other things you'll have to worry about at some point, but don't worry about them right now. You can start by declaring the type class instances next to the type class in the same module or next to the Sometimes, when you need a custom instance, you can introduce a new type. Imagine you have user data type declared in some other module. We want to add an arbitrary instance in some tests so we can create an invalid user, wrap the user around, create some arbitrary instances, and test it this way. Sometimes you can add an orphan instance and not use a new type. It's not encouraged by the compiler or people on the internet, but still legal and sometimes unavoidable. And remember that you can get a lot for free with deriving. In Haskell, you can derive a lot, starting with show all the way to traversable and beyond. Usually, a library will have some examples of how to derive required type class instances, including imports and extensions. <laughs> Don't know or stress about it. And if it doesn't include the extensions or you copy the code from somewhere else, the compiler will give you a hint about what's missing. Here is an example from ISON, which tells us to use derive generic extension, derive <laughs> generic, and then the get instances for to JSON and from JSON. To expand your vocabulary, start with generalized new type deriving, which is included in GC21, then check out strategies, deriving strategies, which is also included in GC2021, deriving via, and maybe, maybe deriving any class. Imagine we have a quota and we want it to behave like an integer, we can use deriving via to behave like an integer. If you want to read more about extensions, the GC docs are good, and there are a couple of other guides online. While we're on the topic, the two most common ways to generate boilerplate in Haskell are template Haskell and generic programming, not Java generics, even more generic generics. That's one of the reasons not to refer to parametric polymorphism as just Java generic types. Let's start with template Haskell, because it's easier to explain as an overview. I, I wouldn't claim that the template Haskell itself is actually easy. You use the template Haskell language extension and write template Haskell, or you use code that generates boilerplate via template Haskell. Libraries often provide a specific template Haskell module, or even a separate package, with functions to derive necessary instances. For example, the JSON library we just saw has data ASON template Haskell module, which provides machinery for us to derive JSON via template Haskell. 
Generic programming comes in different shapes and forms. I'd say the most relevant is GC Generics with the derived generic extension, which is included in GC 2021, because it's the one that libraries usually use. Once again, let's look at ISON, derived generic extension, GC generic import, and a couple of instances to get to JSON and from JSON. There is also Generics SOP, which is seemingly more accessible than GC Generics if you want to generate your own boilerplate, but maybe in the future, because if you're watching this, you should probably not write that kind of generic code yet. There's also generic program via data typable and data.data. See Scrapio boilerplate. It came before GC generics, uses a different approach and feels more straightforward. However, it's usually not recommended anymore because it's less efficient. But that's what they say on the internet. I've never compared any of those, so you do you. So template Haskell is like macros and generics are like shapeless. As I mentioned in the overview, there is no consensus on writing Haskell like whatsoever on any topic. However, it's essential to know your type classes. Those are a must. Functor, applicative, monad, semigroup, monoid, foldable, traversable, and alternative. If the library has a functionality that can be provided by one of those, for example, mapping things or smooshing things together, it's likely that it's going to be provided and won't be very documented. When it comes to failure handling, the situation is not much better than in Scala. I cannot help you here. You on your own. But know this. Option is called maybe. You should see exceptions and some exceptions, which are cousins of throwable. You should see synchronous exceptions, which is about throwing exceptions in I.O. Or see safe exceptions package, which is about throwing exceptions not in I.O. but in more generic app with a whole. They don't have this in Haskell. I mean, when you have monad throw M. Anyways, maybe see unleaved I.O. exception as a safe exception surrogate and see asynchronous exceptions. You might be tempted to use error, they should never happen in pure code because it's so easy and compiles, but just a friendly reminder, it eventually does happen. Don't be lazy, don't trust other teams to respect your contracts, and be cautious. Think about your future self. From time to time, people bring up simple Haskell, boring Haskell, and stuff like that, but there are no actual rules, communities, or many guidelines for those. The one way that Haskell or JC varies between companies and projects is via the language extensions. You need to start recognizing extensions and what they change, notice which extensions are enabled per module, which for the whole project, also get familiar with language additions, such as GC 2021, I've been talking about this whole time, in GC 2024. Note how to enable those and what's included in which one. When it comes to organizing or structuring the code or application, there are a couple of options. There is plain I.O., MTL and Transformers, custom monads on top of those, I.O. plus Reader T, Rio, and Lift I.O., service and handle patterns, free monads, free or simple, extensible effects, fuse effects, F, effectful, clef, polysemy, bluefin, and, and a couple of other effect libraries that I forgot to mention. Sure, I can oversimplify and say that if you use cat effect and tagless finally, you should use that, or if you use Zio, you can use that, but what's the fun in that? Just a quick note, if you're looking for something like resource for your library of choice and cannot find it or make it work, try starting or searching from bracket and function prefixed with with, for example, with pull. Also see resource T and managed libraries. Okay, let's talk concurrency. The second best topic after exceptions. Haskell has green threads, which are provided by Haskell runtime system. You don't need a specific library for that. MVAR is MVAR and ref is called IORF. You should also check out async package, check out STM and check out bracket, which we mentioned before. And a bonus recommendation, see parallel and concurrent programming in Haskell book. Okay, so let's get back to stuff I can actually be a bit of a help. There is no universal answer when it comes to tooling. If you're using Nix, do what you're doing. If not, install GT app and install everything else through it. It's kind of like Corsair setup. There are two main build tools in Haskell, Cabal and Stack. If your team or the project that you're using uses either one, just choose that one. And if you're starting a new project for yourself, you can choose by throwing a coin or partially depending on the preferred dependency workflow. We're gonna talk about this later. You can use GC app to install HLS, which is Haskell language server protocol support. So you can use whatever supports LSP. I use VS Code, using Haskell with it is not that different from using Scala, you just restart it occasionally to make it work, but you can also use IntelliJ via the LSP plugin. Obviously, don't expect Java level IDE support. Try integrating GCI into your development workflow. It's more than just REPL, it's closer to Scala worksheets with abilities to debug and inspect. For example, get a type or a kind of expression and get available type class instances for a data type. In other words, if there is some Scala or IntelliJ functionality or workflows that is missing in the Haskell editor, you might substitute it by using GHCI. If you're looking for some function or some data type, you can still use dot .completion on a module. But if you don't know where to look, try Hoogle or some local alternative, meaning you don't have to go to the Hoogle website, you can just do it in your CLI or 
or whatever. Actually, you don't even need to do that. You can also use type holes. Just put an underscore anywhere in your code and get compiler suggestions. For example, if we put underscore in one of the functions we used before, it's going to tell us that it's found a hole from user ID to IO. It's going to tell us where it found it, what is the relevant bindings, and even says that the valid hole fits patch user that was there before. And not because it was there before, just because the type fits. But there are also other suggestions. If you're looking for a library or a package, you can still poke around Google or you can search on Hackage, the central package archive by text. But here's the first catch. There could be too many options. For example, see my video in Haskell and Postgres. I don't have a rule of thumb here. You can try asking around, but the more people you ask, the more answers you're going to get. Sometimes I believe that the solution is to ask only one person or two and not more. The opposite is also common. Sometimes there are no options. Sometimes there are bindings on top of a C library. For example, one of the most popular Kafka libraries is up around C library. So if you cannot find anything, there is always CFFI. One of the cool things about Haskell is you don't have to search for specific library versions or use specific library versions compatible with other libraries. There are a few other ways to deal with dependency versions. You can use stackage snapshots. A snapshot is a set of compatible Haskell libraries. You can use loose version bounds or no bounds at all for your dependencies. For example, if you don't care about reproducibility or like living on the edge. You can also use Cabal Freeze to pin down the dependencies, which ensures more reproducible builds, something like SBT lock, SBT dependency lock, or locks in other languages systems. If or when you want to learn more, Haskell.org has a list of all sorts of learning resources. On top of that, if you want to get weekly Haskell content, see Haskell Weekly News newsletter, see Haskell Awesome, see Liebhans newsletter, and Haskell Planet Aggregator. If you want to chat Haskell, see Discourse Haskell.org or find your own echo chamber. There's plenty of options. And here's the last thing I want to cover. If you are not proactive enough with catching up with less beginner Haskell, you might bump into a known syntax. So here are a few more pointers. If you encounter at symbol followed by type, see type applications. If you encounter a pipe in a type class declaration, see functional dependencies. If you encounter words type family, data family, or an associated type or data, see type families. If you encounter too many for alls or suspiciously nested for alls, see rank and types, or maybe existential quantification. If you feel like there is too much happening on the type level, see data kinds or type level literals or something along those lines. If you see where in a data declaration, see JDTs or JDT syntax. And congrats, you are one step closer to mastering Haskell. Just a few hundred more to go. Hopefully this is useful as a standalone resource. Usually it's accompanied with follow-up questions. Let's see how it goes.